Welcome to the first episode of the WCO Integrity Web Series, hosted by the WCO Anti-Corruption and Integrity Promotion Program. In this series, we will be inviting our experts from around the world and hope to shed some light on issues relating to integrity in customs. We are very pleased to be here today with Brenda Mundia. She is Deputy Director of the WCO Capacity Building, and she will be kicking off our series by telling us a little about what the WCO is doing about corruption in customs. Good morning, Brenda. Good morning. It is my pleasure launching this WCO Integrity Web Series. Thank you for being here. Um, as the WCO's integrity agenda is currently driven by the Capacity Building Directorate, we are keen to hear from you in this first session as to what the WCO is doing to fight corruption and promote integrity in customs. Brenda, the floor is yours. Thank you. To kick off this series, I'd like to briefly remind you why it is so important to address the issue of corruption in customs directly. While we know corruption happens everywhere, there are some specific features of customs operations and administration that can make it particularly a target for corruption, as well as several reasons why the consequences of corruption in customs environment can be especially significant. We see here a few of the unique features of customs that can make them more of a target since there are particular pressures involved. Customs officers have direct contacts with goods, people, and money. Customs officers have important decisions to make on duty and tax or admissibility of imports and exports. Customs personnel often work in remote border stations away from family. And let's not forget that clearance of goods is time sensitive. Last but not least, we acknowledge that customs are often pointed out as being a corrupt sector. And also, compared to corruption in other sectors, corruption in customs can have serious consequences, including, but not limited to, revenue leakage, reduction in public trust and confidence, reduction in compliance, reduction in community protection and national security, barriers to international trade and economic development, and increased costs ultimately borne by the community. So these are just some of the consequences of corruption in customs. We can therefore understand that corruption can be an obstacle to development in all of the areas for which customs typically has a mandate. And these are revenue collection, trade facilitation, enforcement, and security. Integrity and corruption are often seen as side issues, but we see here how it affects all parts of customs. What a crossing issue it is. And I also must mention that today we are seeing an increasing acknowledgement by customs administrators on the need to address these integrity issues. By addressing revenue leakage from customs, we can increase revenues and resources for a better capacity to address corruption. And finally, improving the effectiveness of enforcement and security operations increases internal and external controls, which reduce space for corruption. So it is really interesting to see here how integrity has both a cause and effect impact on customs mandate. The WCO strategy, strategies reflect those of our 183 members. And we see now how important it is that integrity is at the heart of everything that we do. For this reason, the WCO's core strategy policy document emphasizes the fight against corruption, the safeguarding of integrity, and the enhancement of good governance measures. I must also highlight that our 2019 to 2022 strategic priorities and emerging initiatives also include 
enhancing the integrity and professionalism of customs officers in cooperation with external stakeholders. That being said, how do we do this? For starters, I think it is important to see together a particular WCO policy instrument, the revised Arusha Declaration, which underpins the WCO's approach to combat corruption and promote integrity. This instrument was developed from combining the views and experiences of our members relating to what they found helped them to be successful in their respective fights against corruption in customs. The main feature of this revised Arusha Declaration is that it contains 10 key factors that are seen as essential for any national customs integrity program to be effective. And these 10 elements include leadership and commitment, regulatory framework, reform and modernization, transparency, automation, audit and investigation, code of conduct, human resource management, morale and organizational culture, and relationship with the private sector. It is therefore critical to notice each of the key factors, focus on actions that are relevant in the unique context of customs operations and administration. So all the direction that the revised Arusha Declaration gives is practical and under the control and within the capacity of the head of customs. Of course, we know customs operates in a much wider environment. So the revised Arusha Declaration also directs customs to engage with other actors to combat corruption, in particular, the private sector. And this is why we emphasize on collective action. Um, thank you for this, Brenda. And we will have an opportunity to see this particular instrument in little more details in future episodes of this web series. We also hope to see how the key factors of the revised Darusha Declaration help members address common drivers of corruption, as well as how specific tools can help members implement it. Uh, but for now, Brenda, could you please tell us a little more about what other things the WCO is doing in the area of integrity? Sure, the WCO is doing quite a lot in this area of integrity and uh, corruption. Let us start with the WCO Integrity Subcommittee. This committee acts as a focal point for the design, development, implementation, and evaluation of the WCO Integrity Action Plan and integrity-related tools. It also advises the WCO Council through the Policy Commission on the appropriateness of WCO strategies and priorities necessary to promote the importance of integrity and ensure the effective implementation of the revised Arusha Declaration. The Integrity Subcommittee also provides a forum for the exchange of views, experiences, best practices approaches between member administrations. Finally, it ensures effective coordination and promotion of integrity-related activities with the private sector and other international organizations and the effective integration of integrity principles in all WCO training and technical assistance programs, conventions, and other instruments. Other related committees and working bodies also play a part, such as the Capacity Building Committee, the Information Management Subcommittee, the Performance Management Working Group, and the WCO Gender Equality and Diversity Program. We also have a number of additional tools and instruments that the WCO has developed in order to help its members implement integrity-related activities. These are all available on our website, but it is important to also note that there are many other WCO tools that can be utilized to support members looking to implement the revised Arusha Declaration. For example, our People Development Package, which can provide support under the Human Resource Management Key Factor and various guidance on the revised Kyoto Convention, which plays a big part under the regulatory framework 
and reform and modernization key factors. That's a very good point, Brenda, and we will be detailing some of these supporting tools in future episodes of this web series. In the meantime, can you tell us a bit more about what the WC is doing in the area of capacity building regarding integrity? Yes, of course. Again, in this area, the WC is doing a lot. It is our job in capacity building to help innovative ways to impart knowledge and understanding upon our members. The WCO has a unique model for technical assistance and capacity building that aims to add value by drawing from the WCO's strongest competences, which include cooperation and standard setting. We focus on customs to customs expert support and can help members access our collective wealth of experiences through both remote and in-country support. In addition to technical advice, we can provide training in the use of WCO tools and instruments, as well as monitoring of progress and performance. So uh, members looking for ad hoc support in their integrity related initiatives can address their needs in the WCO's annual needs assessment process, which we initiate every January. So letters are usually sent around the beginning of the year, as I've mentioned in January, via our regional offices for capacity building and also directly to the members. For those needing more sustained support over a long period of time, they can express their interest in specific multi-annual programs the WCO has for this purpose. The ASIP program, as you know, supports members looking to address the issues of corruption in customs more directly and helps them to implement various key factors of the WCO's revised Arusha Declaration. Another program, the Mercator program, which has multiple projects under it, focusing mostly on trade facilitation, can also be useful to members looking to provide more transparency and predictability in their customs operations. While it is more focused on these aspects in the context of trade facilitation, as I have mentioned, as you know, these are also important elements of any integrity program and well aligned with many of the key factors of the revised Arusha Declaration. Thank you, Brenda, for this very interesting presentation. Indeed, you have provided many relevant and important aspects of uh, WCO work uh, in terms of integrity. And as mentioned earlier, some of those will be further detailed in the next episodes of the uh, WCO Integrity web series. Next week, we'll see together how we can talk about corruption in customs. It is a sensitive topic and there is a lot to say about how to tackle it appropriately. Thank you for watching. We hope you liked this episode and we'll see you in the next session. <laughs>